Hey there, and welcome back to another Miraculous Ladybug Season 5 video. And today we'll be talking about Episode 7, Passion, which, well, it's a pretty big episode, all things considered, with a bunch of Ladybug and Cat Noir moments, a look into Natalie's backstory and her history with the Agrest family, delicious angst, and even a brief look at Emily Agrest. And honestly, this is probably one of my favourite episodes of the season so far. And it's one of those episodes that really just proves how far the writings come from the early days, where the plot would go at snail pace and there was next to no character development. And so, with all that being said, let's jump into the episode. So we start off the episode in the classic location of Marinette's bedroom, where it seems that once again, Marinette and Alia have been having a bit of a sleepover. And Marinette, much to Alia's shock, is revealing that she might have accidentally gone and fallen in love with Cat Noir. And yeah, Ali is a bit shocked at this, and honestly, she takes it a lot better than I would take it. I would be mad if I had a friend that was obsessed with a guy, and dragged me into their crackpot schemes to win their love and constantly pined away, I don't know, for about a year or so, only to be told, out of nowhere, oh yeah, 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 I've moved on now, that's old news. Now I like this other dude who's liked me for ages. I'd be so salty. And yeah, I would also be kind of suspicious, just like Alia is, because Marinette just loves to self-sabotage. And so, it would be within her MO that as soon as Adrian is available and interested, she suddenly wants to pursue somebody else, out of nowhere. Hmm, that's pretty sus. I'll admit it. And then Marinette just justifies everything by talking through how every time she tried to romance Adrian, it ended in disaster. And that the most recent time, she lost the majority of the Miraculouses. But Cat Noir is, of course, different. And trying to romance him couldn't have any possible pitfalls or risks attached whatsoever. Except the fact that she doesn't know who he is and he doesn't know who she is. And they actually can't share their identities whilst Monarch's still an active threat, so bad luck there. And of course, Alia so helpfully points all of this out. And I'm really enjoying Alia's recent arc of just straight up telling Marinette how it is. She's tired of all these crazy shenanigans and she's gonna let her know about it. She then tells Marinette that she's simply running away from her true feelings, and she needs to pull her head in. Also, I love that Alia and Tiki have developed their own little friendship where they just sit there and watch the car crash that is Marinette's quest for romance. Very wholesome. Anyway, whilst Marinette tries to go to school in her pyjamas to escape the difficult conversation, Adrian is hitting us with our daily dose of cringe. As he wakes up, whispering Marinette's name, draws a picture of her in the fog in his bathroom mirror, and just says her name out loud a couple more times like a creep. And thankfully, Plague is pissed at all this. I would also be pissed at this. Because once again, Plague has been stuck with Adrian as almost the only person in the world that he can actually talk to. And Adrian, that entire time, has been obsessed with Ladybug. And so unlike Tiki, who had Alia and the other Kwamis for a fair bit of time, Plague has nobody to share his problems with. So he's just stuck with Adrian the Cringe Machine 24-7. Anyway, seems Adrian's finally willing to let Ladybug go, and is now going to obsess over somebody new. <sighs> this is what happens when parents do not take an interest in their kids. Nobody's taught him about healthy levels of romantic interest. Drawing a girl you have a crush on in your foggy bathroom mirror, and talking about how you're in love with them after you've been on one sort of date, is very weird. I can only speak from my life experience, but if one of my friends was doing this shit, I'd be giving them some super intense side eye. Moving on though, we get another look at wholesome Gabe as he makes pancakes once again for Adrian and huh, I love this version of Gabe. I honestly kind of wish they had him behave this way the entire time. It makes the contrast of him and his villain persona more pronounced and makes everything feel a whole lot more tragic. You really can tell that they're trying to make you sympathize with him more this season, but honestly, I'm not really buying it at this stage. I really do think they needed this shift in characterization way earlier. Natalie then bursts in and starts raging at Gabe instantly for not spending more time with Adrian, and thus not knowing that he prefers to have his pancakes plain, not with banana. And it's a weird thing to get angry about, but sure. And then ironically, she bulldozes Adrian when he tries to speak up and keeps yelling at Gabe instead, which he instantly redirects by asking her how she likes her pancakes. Man, Gabe has suddenly become a master of social interaction and de-escalation. Who would have thought? And of course, she's still wearing one of his twin rings, so I guess Adrian thinks that she and Gabe are getting married and this is just a bit of banter. Also, love the part where Gabe tells her to call him Gabriel, and she responds by calling him Gabe instead. Gave me a good giggle. Gabe supremacy. Anyway, back to the whole family thing. Adrian's clearly misinterpreted everything, and that's a little bit heartbreaking. Poor Adrian, he just wants a mum. 
Anyway, the time comes for Adrian to get ready for school, and thus, off he runs, which leads to Natalie pinning Gabe down on the table. And imagine being so pathetic that a dying woman is easily able to overpower you. And yes, yes, I know, he's also slowly dying. But I would argue that she's worse off. Her lungs are wrecked, judging by all the coughing and stuff, and she has a robotic exoskeleton to help her walk and stand. <sighs> and he's getting overpowered by that? Come on, Gabe. Anyway, she starts ranting at Gabe about how she'd originally only come to live in the house to help him hunt down magical artifacts. But that over the years, she'd become his bodyguard, his friend, his right-hand woman, and even more... Hmm. <laughs> Guess old Gabe has needs as well, eh? Woohoo, Gabe, you old dog. She then goes on to tell him that he's straight up crazy and that he's no longer doing any of this out of love for Emily and that she's only sticking around to try and protect Adrian from his craziness. And honestly, not really seen much of that protective instinct before. There's been four seasons of being Gabe's number one henchman and not stepping in once to help stop Adrian's abuse. But suddenly, when Gabe makes his mistake in evolution that ends up costing her her health, suddenly she's got the death sentence. Oof. But now he's the bad guy, and she's only staying to protect the children. Sure. You know what they say about glass houses, Natalie? For shame. Anyway, it's then revealed that Emily never wanted any of this anyway. So, I guess that sinks my Emily's the true villain theory forever. Aw, that sucks. And hey, she even left them recordings, but Gabe refuses to accept this. And now he's even more determined to get them, as he's dying himself, and Natalie's dying too, and thus Adrian's going to be all alone unless they get the Miraculouses. Old Gabe really has screwed the pooch on this one, eh? Moving on, Adrian talks to Plague in his room about how Natalie's wearing one of the family rings, which means that she and his dad must be getting along. <laughs> uh, sweet, wholesome, and naive Adrian. I love how his mind simply goes to them being closer, as if giving one of your wedding rings from your deceased wife to somebody else is something you do when you're simply dating. I mean, how does he not think, oh, maybe they're getting married, at the very least. Oh, this kid. Anyway, he then starts talking about getting a ring for Marinette, and it's like, hey, let's just pump the brakes there, kiddo. It's been like, what, an episode or two since this whole love thing even kicked off? Give it time to breathe. What's next? Sifting through a garbage bin? I mean, surely it's a bit early to be proclaiming love about this girl when in canon, it really hasn't been all that long. I don't know, a couple weeks max since he was drooling all over Ladybug like a total simp. And Plague agrees, because he calls him a foolish simp, which simply convinces Adrian to confess his love during recess. What's going on in this kid's head? This really feels like a bit much. Maybe instead, I don't know, ask her to the movies, out for lunch, something less weird than confessing love. And so anyway, Adrian goes off to find Natalie to ask for some advice on what he should do. Which, you know, that is actually pretty cute. And speaking of Natalie, she's in her bedroom, having her own little panic attack at the thought of her failing to honour Emily's request to look after both Adrian and Gabe. And so she heads over to a safe installed behind a picture of Gabe, Emily and herself in their adventuring days, and opens up a safe that has a journal, a letter, and a phone. And she takes out the phone and watches back a message from Emily that brings her to tears. And so then Natalie vows to get her hands on the Miraculouses before Gabe does, because obviously in her eyes, Gabe is crazy and he needs to go down. Adrian then comes in and starts asking about the best way to woo people. Should he be all cheesy and romantic or should he go another route? And so he prods and pokes at Natalie, asking about the first time she fell in love, which makes her privately reminisce about when she was young and she happened to fall in love with Gabe whilst living out a real-life Tomb Raider storyline. And all the while, he fell in love with Emily. And yeah, that's kind of sad. But at least from this, we learn that Natalie's a true ride-or-die friend. Even when her friend and the dude she loved fell in love with each other and had a kid, she stuck around. Many people would become bitter or need space, but Chad and Natalie didn't let her get her down. She stuck around, and she even took over a mothering role for Adrian in Emily's honour. And suddenly... Natalie has become a far better character, although still doesn't wipe out the fact that she was complicit in Gabe's abuse of Adrian for like four seasons. Although when they first wrote that, I doubt that her backstory was all that super fleshed out. If they had their time again, I'm thinking the writing for Natalie would probably have been far more sympathetic the whole way through. I doubt she would have been presented as so much of a henchman type of character. And then she starts coughing, and Adrian panics and asks about if what's happening to her is what happened to his mum, but she reassures him and then hurries him off so he won't be late for school, before breaking out into a coughing fit. Okay, so 
In the past, I made a video saying that realistically she dies this season. And I didn't particularly care at the time because, you know, she was a henchman type character. But now I don't want her to die. Damn it! Meanwhile, Gabe's partaking in his favourite hobby, monologuing to his wife's refrigerated corpse and lamenting that he doesn't know what to do and he feels all alone. Only for Natalie to somehow sneak up on him to tell him that he's not alone. And honestly, come on Gabe, how's she going to sneak up on you? For one, she is about as subtle as Robocop. She's got robo legs, come on man, they make noise. And on top of that, the only way into this chamber is via the secret elevator. Come on, idiot. Anyway, Natalie tells Gabe that she's going to help him by getting akumatized, despite that likely speeding up her death clock. As in all honesty, she's quite determined to get the Miraculouses to make the wish to try and help Adrian. We then move on to the school, where we have a deeply awkward scene where Adrian bumps into Marinette, who unleashes her own brand of premium cringe as she stutters and stumbles through their interaction. She only actually pauses this cringe to ask how Adrian is and comfort him as he's upset about Natalie being sick, before he goes on to tell her how great she is and how she always has the right words. And so she instantly panics and runs away. Not exactly how you'd want your first romantic interaction with somebody to play out. I mean this, and her reaction to their date at the museum, this should give Adrian some signals. Whew, for the sake of your dignity, Adrian, take a step back. Anyway, Plague then clowns on him a little bit, because this season, the Kwamis are back to having a bit more personality. Thank God. And then, well, turns out Tiki and Plague these days decide to play fast and loose with the rules. As they're just in a spare classroom hanging out. Not hiding, just chilling. And I mean, I doubt this is the first time they've ever done this as well, because Plague enters the classroom to complain, knowing she's there. So that means she must frequent this classroom. And you can double down on that, as she's confident enough to be playing with art supplies without fear of discovery. Meaning that they've been there quite a lot before. And honestly, fair enough. If I was a Kwame, I'd need time away for myself as well. Anyway, Plague's panicking as Adrian's fallen in love with Marinette, not just Ladybug anymore, but Marinette the person. And since Tiki says that Marinette is in love with Adrian slash Cat Noir, he's worried that it's all going to come to fruition. They're going to fall in love, and they'll share their secret too soon, and the world will end. And whilst it's a little bit dramatic, it's also true. In all of the what-if scenarios, it shows that Plague is right. Whenever they share their identities, everything goes to shit. So Monarch's got to go first. Of course, Tiki does not share his concerns. And she unleashes a scathing critique of Marinette, laughing about the fact that she never gets anywhere when she falls for someone romantically. Ouch! I mean, it's true, Tiki, but why you gotta be so cruel? She just knits hats and makes complicated plans that never come to fruition? Ouch! Tiki unleashing the harsh truths. Also, I feel like Tiki doesn't even try to help Marinette improve in this regard either. Does she take sick enjoyment out of seeing her suffer? Is Tiki the true villain of Miraculous Ladybug? <laughs> I think we all know the truth now. Moving on, we then get our villain for the episode, Safari, as Natalie outright dictates to Gabe that she wants the power to never miss her prey, and he akumatizes her old treasure hunter gear that she keeps in her bedroom in a display case. And then he gives her the power of the goat, which she then uses to make her own little crossbow, which can use various different miraculous powers, plus a bunch of other hunter gear. And so off she goes to enact her actually really decent plan. She starts out first by shooting out a mirage of Time Tagger to attract her prey, before lying in wait for the heroes to turn up. So, obviously, with the arrival of a villain, Paris begins to panic, and Adrian and Marinette run off to transform. Marinette is mostly excited to see Cat Noir again, and it's like, oh, come on, get your head in the game, kid. And Tiki's face in this entire scene just gives me life. More and more, I think it's starting to sink into Tiki's mind that her almighty holder is, when it comes to the matter of the heart, a relentless, smooth brain. And I think this would be a depressing realisation for anyone, really. Of course, our heroes then link up and don't notice Safari, because why would they? And so her weapon locks on, and she sends out some venom shots, first at Ladybug, but presumably she does the same for Cat Noir off screen, because, you know, some of them chase him later on. But anyway, now it's back to the smooth brain heroes. Ladybug and Cat Noir are just lingering in an alleyway, making sure they don't get ambushed, before, after Cat Noir gives off a bit of banter, about how maybe Time Tagger went back to his own time. And at this point, Ladybug completely smooths out her brain and starts rambling about how they should go and see a movie together because, you know, that's surely the perfect time for that now when you have a villain whose gun can shoot you back in time and trap you there as you no longer have the rabbit miraculous. And so your only hope would be that at some point, one of the various different rabbit users throughout history notice that you're there when they're in the burrow and they help you out. 
or you gotta hope that the Order of the Guardians have been founded so you can walk to Tibet. But yes, now is the perfect time for you to awkwardly ask your co-worker out on a date. <sighs> anyway, she then cringes, as she does realise that she's being cringe, before she gets hit by the Venom Bolt. And yeah, I'm not really surprised. So now Cat Noir has to run away from more of these things that are locked onto him, whilst also carrying Marinette along for the ride. Anyway, there's a fun little action sequence with some excellent banter from Cat Noir where he calls out Safari for harassment before he goes into the sewers because, you know, they love the sewers. I mean, who doesn't love sewers? Also, it just sank into me that Ladybug legit jumped into the sewer water a couple of episodes ago, but at least she was in a, you know, a skin-tight bodysuit. Maybe she had that mask on for the aquatic form. Okay, I can accept that. And after all, she thought Gabe had fallen in. She wanted to save him, even though it was only, you know, a fake illusion Gabe. But that leaves me to assume that the real Gabe, who had just detransformed from Monarch, had to have jumped in as well to simulate being wet. I mean, after all, the water is green. Ugh. Imagine him diving into that stuff. Oh, so gross. Anyway, back to the story though. And in a moment of epic plot armor, just as Cat Noir's about to get hit by the Venom Stings, his ring timer runs out. Quickest timer of all time in this show. And he suddenly becomes Adrian again, and thus the homing beacon fails. Yeah, okay, why not? And so he and Plague have the idea to take off Ladybug's Miraculous. Well, I mean, Plague has to do it. And Adrian becomes Mr. Bug. Because after all, Safari's not hunting Mr. Bug and Lady Noir. Anyway, so they remove her earrings, and for some reason this wakes up Marinette. Even though when the exact same thing happened to Bunnix in, like, Evolution, I think? I'm pretty sure she stayed frozen by the Venom. Regardless, it works somehow. And then after a brief moment of weakness where Adrian wants to use the wish to fix the world, they both transform into Mr. Bug and Lady Noir. And can we address one thing before this? Adrian says that he's in love with Marinette, and yet even without the magical protection of the Miraculouses, he can't recognise her voice. It seems that the aggressed smooth brain strikes again. Also, is it just me, or does Mr. Bug look like way better than Cat Noir? I think I prefer the more bulky, armoured look. Just makes him feel more different. And, I don't know, more heroic. And in that vein, I also think that Lady Noir is a superior base suit than Ladybug's original suit. Although, the Lucky Charm Ladybug suit, that's my favourite design. But of course this is not a fashion show. It's a superhero show. So we'll keep going. Or at least, that's what I expected, but I guess this is a fashion show. As Lady Noir immediately begins to thirst about how handsome Adrian looks in the bug costume. So basically, he gets a taste of his own medicine about how annoying it would be to have someone flirting with them 24-7. And you can kind of see in his eyes that he just doesn't know how to react to it. It serves him right, honestly. Although, I must admit, the dynamic here is rather cute at first. Mostly because here Marinette's just word vomiting every chance she gets instead of being overly pushy. Plus, she also has these extreme moments of clarity where she realises how cringe she's being, but she just can't stop. Moving on, they spend some time doing everything they can to try and get the Akuma, and they smash her crossbow, only to find that nothing was there. Uh-oh, a smart villain who has non-obvious Akuma? What are they going to do? Anyway, her whip is really strong, and she starts launching shit at them, including a bus. A bus that helpfully honked its horn as it was falling on them to allow the heroes to dodge it before it smashed into the cinema. So, I guess the driver was still in the bus and honked at them to save them? And I'm guessing he's also probably pretty dead now. Guess it's a good thing they can bring him back with the Ladybug Miraculous, but still, damn, what a way to go. Also, it turns out that Safari's planning to double-cross Gabe and intends to use the wish herself, whilst also keeping him under her thumb by threatening to reveal who he is to the kids. A very smart villain indeed. How rare. They smash more of her shit, and Adrian realises the Akuma is in her suit back home. So he lucky charms, he gets a bottle of perfume, which he then uses as an excuse to go to Gabe's house, using a very half-baked solution. But since Lady Noir's enamoured with him, she just accepts it and pursues Safari, who's in the midst of chasing down Adrian, spouting off some pretty Cat Noir-esque lines. They do the Akuma, they fix things, yada yada, you know how these things always go. And then after some more flirting from Lady Noir, where she asks for a goodbye kiss, very Cat Noir, we cut to Alia and Tiki, listening to Marinette's recounting of the day's events, before she suddenly goes off on a pretty weird tangent, talking about how Mr. Bug was all rawr, and how cute he looked, etc. And I mean, you can even see the moment that Alia and Tiki both die inside. I too would be depressed if I had to endure this. But yeah, that's the end of the episode. Once again, I enjoyed this one. It was some decent fun. 
and swapping up the Miraculouses is always a pretty good concept. I also really like the role reversal we've had in their dynamic. It was a much needed shift and the show feels way more fresh than it did before. But as always, these are just my opinions and now I'd like to hear yours. What did you think of the episode? You like it, hate it? I'm curious for your thoughts, so make sure to like, comment, and subscribe and let me know.